Good morning. Welcome to Redeemer Lincoln Square. I am Vanessa Hawkins. What a joy it is for me to lead us through our liturgy this morning. If you're joining us in person, welcome. Thank you for weathering the cold to hang out here with us to worship. If you're joining us for, from online, from our live stream, welcome. We're so glad you're here. There are a few ways to follow along with the elements of worship today. If you've got a printed bulletin, um, that's great. That works. If you're watching from live stream, there is also the opportunity to grab that link in your video description to our digital bulletin, redeemerlsq.com slash bulletin. However you're joining us, we are thrilled that you are here. Um, we will have what we like to call Q&R, question and response, immediately following worship. Here at Redeemer LSQ, we are a church that values questions and the people who ask them. And so it is our delight to engage with you as you text us questions throughout worship. Um, we will also um, have an opportunity for prayer and a number of other good things that we'll mention uh, a little bit later in the worship but now, as we consider and prepare for our call to worship, we remember that worship is about the worthiness of the one who is calling us, and it's about us bringing him our wholehearted devotion. So we have the privilege of gathering in this space together to declare God's worthiness, his majesty, his splendor. We get to praise him for who he is and for all that he has done. And it's a moment where we intentionally answer the Father's call from ages past to his people to worship him and him alone in spirit and in truth. So we join with the universal church this morning, and we join with the very angels in heaven who cry holy to our God and King. Won't you stand now and let's hear the psalmist echo our God's call to worship. Listen to my words, Lord. Consider my lament. Hear my cry for help, my King and my God. Let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Shelter them that those who love your name may rejoice in you. Let's continue our worship with songs of praise.
Gracious God, how we do adore you. To consider who you are is to adore you. Lord, we strain to find words to describe your goodness and to describe your loving kindness, to describe your beauty. But Lord, here we are, adoring you with the words that we have, thanking you for being our God, thanking you for the privilege to be called your children. Lord, we just come adoring you because of your majesty, of your beauty in all of creation. Lord, not just for who you are, but Lord, that you are good and that you are good to your children. You are good to your creation. Lord, we marvel that you are full of power, yet you are gentle and kind. We marvel, Lord, that your words uphold the entire universe, yet you have our heads, the hairs on our heads numbered. 
and you hear our faintest cries. So Lord, we just worship you today and we stop to um, consider who you are and to offer our heart, our wholehearted devotion to you over and over and over again. We pray in the way that your son taught us how to pray as we join our voices together and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. time of in our worship service where we get the privilege of coming to the Lord with our prayer of confession and in our prayer of confession we're admitting at least two things maybe more but at least two we're admitting that we are woefully in need of God's grace and our going says that we believe that he will be gracious and kind to us and that he'll meet us at the point of our deepest need and so we go in confidence and we go knowing that he is full of grace. So won't you pray this prayer of confession with me? Gracious Father, we confess that we have longed too much for the comforts and treasures of this world rather than for your enduring kingdom. We have loved the gifts more than the giver. In your mercy, help us to see that the things we strive for are shadows, but you are the substance that they are quicksand, but you are a mighty rock, that they are shifting, but you are an anchor. Thank you for forgiving us through the riches of Christ and freeing us to live a new life, faithfully devoted to him in Jesus' name. Amen. Won't you take a few moments now to pray that prayer of confession quietly on your own? these words of encouragement from the Gospel of Luke. The prodigal son said, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, 
and kissed him. Oh, 
so grateful for that banner over us, especially as we consider today Palm Sunday. Um, we've come to the time in our worship where we pass the peace. We get the opportunity to greet each other, particularly on today, uh, a happy Palm Sunday. Um, no LSQ kids classes this week, so um, I think it's mentioned in the, in the bulletin that we will have that. We will not. So be sure to fist bump, greet, say hi, give a high five to our youngest members of our congregation. Uh, pass the peace now, please. Welcome back. If you are new to LSQ in particular, we want to issue a hearty, hearty welcome to you. There are lots of places you can worship in this huge city, and so if you're here with us, we don't count that as an accident. We are grateful that you are here. If you're watching online, the World Wide Web is a big place. Thank you for stopping by here to worship with us. Um, if you have joined us since I welcomed you last, uh, the bulletins can be found at RedeemerLSQ.com slash bulletin. Now, next Sunday is Easter, and so on the screen and on the back of your bulletin, I've got a couple of uh, um, emphasis I'd like to make. So first, we are having our special Easter service right here at Ethical Culture at our normal time. 10.30 a.m., and we'd love, love, love for you to join us. So this is also a wonderful time to invite a friend, wherever they are in their faith journey, it's good to hear the resurrection story. And so invite friends, pack this place out. We'd love, love to welcome guests. Um, regarding our kids, we will have classes for babies through sixth grade next Sunday. And so beforehand, our LSQ Kids team is hosting an Easter egg hunt in Central Park. And so I'm a little jealous because I'll be here. But um, they're having a, an Easter egg hunt in Central Park. So to learn more about that, you can email Rebecca Hanna, uh, our kids director, and her email address is on the back of today's bulletin. All right, so secondly, every Easter we collaborate with Hope for New York our partner for Mercy and Justice, and we have an Easter sacrificial offering. And so 100% of the offering that is raised on Easter Sunday goes to help our marginalized members of our community, immigrants, vulnerable women, um, unhoused neighbors, and more. So this year, we've had a generous donor to step up and say that they would match all LSQ gifts up to $25,000 dollar for dollar. And so what a blessing and what an opportunity for our giving to go even further. So um, your gifts next week will serve to help our marginalized neighbors. So now let's turn our attention to the screen. We've got a little video um, from Hope for New, for New York um, that's from Safe Families, one of their affiliates. And this is Sandra's story. So watch on the screen. My name is Sandra. I grew up in Zimbabwe. I have five siblings. Grew up in a very principled home. 
very challenging life because as a girl child, I had to work twice as hard for acceptance. I just had to do what I was told to do. My favorite part of growing up was going to church with my parents. When I was at church, I got to be a kid. When I was growing up, I followed my parents and did not have a personal relationship with God. In Zimbabwe, it's common practice for a girl child to be married off. The man that I was with in my early 30s was very abusive. That's why I had to flee to the U.S. to protect myself and my unborn child. I moved to the U.S. June 2018, feeling very isolated, heavily pregnant with Chrissy, my first child. I felt so lost. No hope, no faith. I was asking God why he allows suffering. I felt abandoned by God. Two days after my daughter was born, I was extremely hungry. I had nobody to leave my daughter with. So I just strapped her and just went out to the supermarket. It was hard because everybody was looking at me. I felt weak, and I felt like a failure. Within two weeks of having Christana, a friend connected me to Safe Families. They assigned me two family friends. For the first time in my life, I was able to be heard without judgment. They came to visit the house, they cooked for us, they played with us. They made me feel worthy and proud to be a mother. It started giving me a lot of hope. They bought me a Bible. And they would call me every night to pray with me. One of the family friends introduced me to Astoria Community Church. I started attending ACC and I met Andrea. Andrea supported me in my faith, helped me to get to a point of having a personal relationship with God. She encourages me to read the Bible, something that I never did. Last year, my husband, Mike, and I got married at Astoria Community Church. And a few months ago, we became members there, and my family was baptized the very same day. Our children are happy, full of life, and they look forward to every Sunday to spend some time with ACC members. They're experiencing a life that I never had and that makes me happy. Safe Families and ACC has changed my life. So I feel safe, loved, and secure. Before, I had no personal relations with God. I knew He was there, but I did not have that personal relationship. But now I am grateful for the gift of life. I would like to Thank God for surrounding me with Safe Families, ACC, and family and friends that have given me extra hope and a purpose. And I'm hopeful for the future and our journey with Christ that God will protect us. My favorite Bible verse is Philippians 4 verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. <laughs> what a
powerful story from Sandra. We've, we've learned um, that Friday, Sandra suffered some health issues and um, has been hospitalized. And so um, would you join me in just having a brief word of prayer for Sandra and others like Sandra? Gracious God, our Father, we thank you that you are the God of the marginalized. You are the God of those who have no hope. You are the God of those who are in need and who um, feel invisible and, and those who um, suffer to have a voice in this world. Lord, we thank you that you have given so much hope to Sandra and to her family. We thank you, Lord, for being the God who restores, the God who heals, the God who strengthens, the God, the God who provides everything that we need according to your riches and glory. And so, Father, we do ask that you would meet Sandra with healing. We pray that you would touch her body and that you would strengthen her. I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen her voice such that her story could be told with power and that she would encourage others, Lord, who are without hope, that they would look to you, the God who is hope, the one who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can think, ask, and imagine. We pray, Lord, that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so... If you weren't able to see the video, by the way, by the way we, re we recognize that there are places in the building that visibility might feel a little limited. We will email the video out for you to see a little bit later in the week. All right, now we'll hear the scripture read by Admiral Gahn, and it will be followed by teaching from Pastor Bruce. Good morning, and happy Palm Sunday. Today's scripture reading is from John chapter 19, verses 38 to 42, and we're going back to John 3, verses 9 to 18. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds, taking Jesus' body. The two of them wrapped it with spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid because it was a Jewish day of preparation and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Well, how can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly, earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the word of our God. Amen. Good morning, everybody. My name is Bruce O'Neill, and I'm one of the pastors here, and I have the privilege this morning uh, to uh, teach this uh, text that was just read to you. I find it interesting sometimes when pop culture um, gives the greater culture a symbol that describes its current beliefs. 
and one of them is a Forrest Gump. If you don't know what that is, you can watch it on Netflix. But in the movie, he says something that has become part of our vernacular, and that is that life is a box of, there you go, chocolates. What he means by that and what our culture means by that is that the center of life is surprise, unexpected, uncertainty. On Sunday mornings, we have been looking at what is the center of life. And our argument has been that the center of life is a death. And that death is the death of Jesus. And so we've had this one question that we've tried to answer on Sunday mornings is, why did Jesus have to die? Or why did Jesus die? And the answer to that question that we're looking at this morning is that Jesus had to die in order to give us new life. And so, this morning, I want to look at these two passages through that uh, a prism of new life. And so, what we have in this text are two Jewish men, both are leaders in the community, Joseph of Arimathea, and then you also have Nicodemus. Joseph is mentioned at this part of Jesus' biography in each of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Whereas Nicodemus doesn't get all that print, this is the only place that Nicodemus is mentioned around the death of Jesus. Except in this Gospel, he's actually mentioned again a little earlier, way back in chapter 3. That's the connection uh, between chapter 19 and chapter 3. It's Nicodemus. And a conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus way back in chapter 3. Nicodemus comes in the cover of night and asks Jesus, uh, how does someone go to heaven? And Jesus' response back to Nicodemus was, the only way to go to heaven is to be born again. And Nicodemus didn't understand that, and so that's why there's this question. And so, what I want us to do this morning is to learn what we can about this new life together. That is, who needs it? Uh, How does uh, what it is itself? And then, how do you know if you have it? And so, first, who needs this new birth? Back in uh, chapter 3, verse 9, there's this question that Nicodemus asked. He says, how can this be? We didn't print for you the entire conversation. Just two verses up from that verse, Nicodemus is the one who, uh, Jesus is the one who answers Nicodemus, how does someone go to heaven with, you must be born again. And Nicodemus then asked, how can an adult be born again? He's thinking literally and physically, how's that even possible? But before we answer that, we have to recognize there's a lot of baggage with this idea of being born again. It is, in some people's mind, um, an emotional experience that only some get to have and others not. Some think of it as a, a, a very moral life, is someone who's been born again. And then thirdly, it has been, and more lately, Uh, associated with a particular political affiliation. But Jesus is saying something radically different than those things when he says you must, in order to get to heaven, you must be born again. So what did Jesus mean? In order to understand what Jesus meant, you have to understand a little bit about who Nicodemus is. And Nicodemus is a ruler. He's one of 70 men who sat on the legislative body of the Jewish community called the Sanhedrin. He's an older man because that's the qualifications to sit on that body. He's a religious leader because he's of the religious conservatives called the Pharisees. He, bottom line, he's an insider. He's not an outsider. He's not Jesus. He is an insider that everybody would have thought of a very prestigious man. Nicodemus, here's my point, already thought he was going to heaven when he asked the question, how does someone get into heaven? He's wondering about everybody else because he's pretty sure he's getting in. 
his standard of a very moral life, he meets. And what Jesus is saying here to him is, whether you're an insider or an outsider, whether you're religious or non-religious, everyone must be born again to get into heaven. Everyone needs this new birth. Not just those on the outside. Not just those that are non-religious. Being born again is is not about being better than everyone else. Being born again is not an emotional experience that only a sum I get to have. And aligning yourself with a political party is not what it means to be born again. But being born again is about believing in Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ accomplished here on earth when he was here. And whatever you are, whether you're an insider or an outsider, whether you're religious or you're non-religious, whether you uh, uh, come to church on a regular basis or you're hardly ever here, everyone must be born again. And so the natural question is, what is this new birth? What does it mean to be born again? You see, Nicodemus, I already said, believed he was going to heaven. He lived a very moral life. He was successful by anyone's standard. He was generous and kind. Do you see what he calls Jesus in, our, in chapter 3? He calls him rabbi. Rabbi is a prestigious uh, a title associated with other religious leaders. And so when Nicodemus, who is a religious leader... Uh, comes to Jesus and says, Rabbi, it is paying homage. It's being gracious. He is being kind to Jesus. Others would not have done that. And so here's Jesus' point in this passage. Those who are moral, wealthy, successful, educated, privileged, and powerful, none of that counts with regards to getting into heaven. The only way to get into heaven is through this new birth. And if that is true, then those who have been immoral, who are born into poverty, who are uneducated and disadvantaged and powerless, they too must be born again. Because Jesus' point isn't that there's one class of people who have access to being this new birth and another class of human beings who are ineligible for this a new birth. He says everyone must have this new birth in order to get into heaven. And if it's true that nothing you do qualifies you, it is also true that nothing you do disqualifies you from this new birth. As long as you have something to commend yourself to God so that he might let you into heaven means that you are your own savior not God. And as long as you think that you can be disqualified from going to heaven because of something that you have done in this life, then you don't need a Savior either because you don't believe you can have one. You see, one group doesn't need a Savior because they are their own Savior, and the other people don't need a Savior simply because they don't believe they can have one. The problem here is not that their saviors are too small. Their problem is they don't think they need one at all. When Jesus says you must be born again, he is saying nothing you can do counts. What do I mean? There was this Augustine monk named Martin Luther in Germany in the 16th century He lived an incredibly moral life as a monk. He was also a a religious leader because he was a professor at a prestigious university teaching a Bible. And while he was there, he had read Romans dozens of times, but he was teaching on Romans and looking at uh, the original language of Romans chapter 1. And he got to this verse, and it changed everything for Martin Luther. This verse goes like this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, it's very famous, verse 16, 
For it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. And here's the key verse that he was looking at. For in that gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And as long as you read that in the English, you might miss what Martin Luther stumbled on. That is, as Martin Luther was looking at the original language and look at the grammar structure and what was being said, he noticed something different for the very first time in studying Romans 1.17. And it is this idea of the righteousness of God. He noticed for the very first time that this is not human righteousness, something that we can commend God that we have done. The word righteous means good deed. It means right standing before God because of what you have done. And so everyone up to that point had read Romans 117 as, I present to God my righteousness. But he noticed for the very first time that what the word there for righteousness of God is a genitive of possession, which we miss because we don't have that in English, but the Greeks do, which means that that righteousness doesn't belong to the subject man. It belongs to the direct object, which is God. That is, it's not the righteousness of man presented to God. It's the righteousness of God given to man. That overturned everything of what he was saying. He was saying, how does someone get into heaven? It's not what I bring and commend myself to God. You have to let me in. Look what I have done for you. I am a monk of all things. I have taken uh, vows of, cel- uh, 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 of celibacy. I mean, <laughs> no marriage. I've taken vows of poverty. That means no money. I've taken uh, 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 vows of, of uh, following you that at great Uh, a sacrifice on my part. He could have commended all these things, but he finally read that this is not his righteousness to commend to God, but God's righteousness that he gives to man. Wow. It also says that by faith. Faith is trusting. What Jesus is saying here in John 3 is that the only way we can go to heaven is not that we commend our good works to God and therefore he has to let us in, but that God gives us his righteousness, his good deeds in order for us to get into heaven. And we either believe that or we don't. And belief in the Bible means simply more than an assent, but I trust in. For instance... If you knew down on Wall Street that if you could put all your money on this one stock, it would make you billions of dollars and you could do it, you trust that truth. Do you trust, do I trust, this is the realization that Martin Luther came to, do I trust that what Jesus did when he was on on earth enough? That that's the only thing that commends me. It's the only thing that counts before God. One more thing about this metaphor of the new birth. If you've been around hospitals or maybe you're uh, fathers and mothers, you know this statement is true. Births are messy experiences. Children are born only through labor, pain, and the blood of someone else. What I'm saying is, is that children do not come into this world through their own pain, their own suffering, and their own blood, but moms. In the ancient world, not only was the mortality rate high for babies, what we often forget is that the mortality rate for mothers was just as high. Often, children were born at the expense of their mother's life. There is absolutely no way for us to get this new birth without the pain and the blood of someone else. What do I mean? Look at verses 16 and 17 of chapter 3 again. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world, condemn it, but to save it through him. And often that's Bible speak to say that someone 
had to go through pain, suffering, and death in order for you to be born. Jesus is saying that I give you new birth through my own mortality. And he didn't do it begrudgingly or with any regret. He doesn't sit up in heaven and look down on you and said, Ooh, buyer's remorse. In fact, when a woman sees the child for the first time that she brought into this world through all of the pain and all the suffering, she does not look back at the pain of the suffering, but the joy what that pain and suffering produced. And is satisfied. Jesus is not in heaven looking down and thinking about you. That look what I did and they wasted it. No, he's in heaven rejoicing over you. Why would he rejoice over you? Why would he rejoice over me? Knowing what we have done. Knowing what we have said. Knowing what we have thought. Knowing what we have felt. Why would God ever rejoice over us? Because when he looks down at you, you are the fruit of all the pain and all the suffering. The nail on a cross, the crown of thorns, the torture that he went through, and even his death. The joy has literally been swallowed up by all the pain. I love this poem written by Frederick Lehman. It ended up becoming a hymn that we don't sing uh, today. He said... Could we, with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though if we could stretch it from sky to sky. So lastly, how do you know if you've got it? If now you know what it is, how do you know if you are born again? First, the new birth creates more courage than you ever had before. What do I mean? Look at, jo this is back in chapter 19. Joseph and Nicodemus are doing what? They've gone to Pilate. They've gone to Pilate to ask at personal risk to themselves to ask Pilate for Jesus' body so that they can bury him. Jesus had just had a public repudiation of his, of his teaching. They just executed him in an embarrassing execution up on a public place for everyone to see. And then these two men go to the governor who just condemned him to death and say, can we have that body? Can you imagine the risk of being identified so closely with Jesus that you want to bury his body? What would the Romans think? Are you two insurrectionists? We thought we just killed off this religion by killing its leader. So two new leaders? So let's execute them too. Great personal risk. But not only risk physically but there's a reputation loss too because if the religious leaders the rest of the 69 of the Sanhedrin had heard about what Nicodemus did think about his reputation they just brought him before Pilate accusing him of trying to become the king of the Jews and here one of their leaders who was probably part of the group that said we got to get this Jesus is now going to ask for his body what would be left of his reputation? And yet in the face of these risks, they still ask for Jesus' body. The fruit of the new birth is that you have the courage to identify with Jesus, maybe for the very first time. Who saved them? Jesus. And at great personal risk, they go and they ask there's a beautiful story about Polycarp. Polycarp was the disciple of John who wrote this gospel. And he takes over after John dies as the bishop of Smyrna, which is one of the uh, seven churches that you read in the book of Revelation. And he's uh, the bishop, he's the leader of the church there in that city. 
And he's about 86 years old when the Romans decide, well, we need to get rid of the leadership of the church because it's really growing here. So we're, we're about 155 uh, CE when they arrest Poly, uh, Polycarp. And all they want Polycarp to do to save his life is to deny Jesus. All we're asking you to do, Polycarp, we're not asking you to uh, burn a candle to the, to the Roman emperor. We're not asking you to bow before our gods. We're just asking you to give up yours. And so Polycarp says this. Eighty-six years have I served him, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? And so they burn him at the stake. And it wasn't going fast enough. So they took out a sword, and they ran him through. Eighty-six-year-old man. One of the hardest places for you to identify with Christ Let me give you two. Work. It's hard in a place that doesn't value Jesus or what Jesus taught for you to identify with Jesus. Does that not sound familiar to Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea? To come in, I'm not saying that that you have a Billy Graham crusade at work. I'm not saying that around the water cooler you're leading whoever's standing there uh, to Jesus. I'm just simply saying, does anybody know that you are a follower of Jesus? Have you ran up that flag so that people will know that you follow Jesus? You might need a little courage. But the hardest, I think, is not work. I think the hardest is family. Because they already know you. They know all the things you've done well, and they happen to also know all the things that you have not done well. And so it's incredibly hard to say, I'm a follower of Jesus, to the very people who say, you follow Jesus? I'd have never guessed that. The new birth makes you bold to take risk on your reputation in order, in order to identify with Jesus. The other thing that I think you can use as an evaluative tool of whether you've been born again is not only this courage, but humility. Back to Joseph and Nicodemus. They didn't stop at acquiring the body of Jesus, did they? They also said, we're going to be the ones who prepare him for burial. We're the ones who are going to take his body and get it ready to sit in a tomb. In, in the ancient world, particularly this part, they didn't bury your body. They rented these places out that your body could decay in public. Well, not public, at least away in a cave with an opening at the top and an opening at the bottom so that the fumes of decay uh, would not ravish anyone coming to your tomb. And so Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus have come to Pilate to get the body so they could prepare it themselves. And what that meant was that they were going to take the body of Jesus and they were going to wash it. Not only were they going to wash that body, they, they were going to take perfume. You know that perfume that was used on Jesus' feet in another passage where, uh, 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 oh gosh, uh, Judas is so upset that they wasted all that money on Jesus and because it was about a year's worth of wages. You see, what people did in that ancient world is the, after you were born, when you become an adult and you start getting money, you start saving up for your own funeral because it's not really that far off. And so people would get perfume because that's what they put over the body until it's fully decayed so it doesn't smell. And so what these two guys have done is they've taken either purchased or used their own perfume for their own funerals to keep Jesus' body freshly smelling until he's fully decayed. And then they would wrap the body in cloths and lay it there and every day they would come back and put new perfume and maybe even wrap the body in further cloths. Whose job is it to do that? It is not in the ancient world. Men did not do that work. That was left to the women to do. And so here are two men who have been born again. And they're recognizing that their Savior's body needs to be buried. And they say, we'll do it ourselves. They humbled themselves in order to do this work. To recognize that Jesus left heaven to come down here allows people 
to become humble. There is now nothing beneath you. And there is no one beneath you. It's one of the things that the gospel does. It turns the world upside down. Rather than looking at the world and asking the world to serve you, you look at the world and you say, how can I serve you? You see, the gospel turns it upside down because nothing now is beneath us. If the King of kings and Lord of lords left heaven and came down here and humbled himself even to death, it means that all of his followers can look at that same world and say, how can I serve the world? John 19 tells us that what Jesus did back in John 3 worked. The conversation he had with Nicodemus, John 19 is the fruit of. Nicodemus has gone with Joseph of Arimathea, gotten the body, buried the body of Jesus. Why? Because they have the new birth. How about us? Have we had a courage that we never had before? Because we have seen what our Savior has done for us. Do we have the humility that comes from recognizing that now no one is above us, no task is beneath us because this is exactly what our Savior did for us. And so when the Father looks down on us, he doesn't see your failures or your good works. He just sees Jesus. And we receive that by faith. And then that empowers us to live courageously, and with great humility. We don't live courageously and, and in humility and say, God, see what I have done. Instead, we see what Jesus has done and it changes the way in which we live. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have given us this, your word. And it is so incredibly encouraging to know that you don't look down on us and evaluate all the things that we can commend to you. But instead, you have given us the very righteousness that belongs to you as our own. And we commend them to you. We receive them by faith. That means that we trust in them and live as a result of that. And that comes out in courage and in humility. And I pray that we grow in grace in both our boldness and in our humbleness. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now is the time in our worship that we get to continue to worship through giving. Would you take a few moments while the music plays to offer your hearts and your gifts to the Lord? Ushers, would you come forward at this time?
much for worshiping here with us today. Stick around. Uh, if you're watching online, give us a few moments. We'll reset the stage and we will have Q&R question and response. If you haven't gotten your questions in, there's still time. So please text us at the number in your bulletin. If you haven't gotten a chance to fill out a connect card and you're visiting with us, we really want to know who you are. We want to follow up with you. We want to pray with you. We want to um, connect with you. So um, complete your connect card and turn it in actually downstairs in, uh, at coffee hour at the connect table. And so connect, uh, coffee hour is a, is a great time to connect with old friends, meet some new ones, and we would love to see you there. All right, here, oh, and if, if you need prayer. The orange prey signs are in the, um, the orchestra, in the, the wings of the orchestra. So there are men and women who would love to pray with you. All right, hear now these um, good words from the book of Jude. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his own glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty dominion and power, both now and forever. And let all God's people say, let us go forth to serve the world as those who love our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Go in peace.